audience mic when they're talking? Oh, no, it won't, it won't be contact. So I do broadcast the, the speaker tonight. Only okay. if the audience are asking questions, it will be captured. Oh, that's because they were saying that if somebody like sneezes or anything, that that's going to capture, it's going to be distracting. Uh, so if I would turn no, it off. No, not anymore. Like, no, okay. Well, I'll be monitoring it. So if it's too loud, I'll turn it off. Oh. <laughs>
I was there, so hello everyone uh, welcome and thank you for joining this first women in stem seminar of the year on women in conservation uh, which has been organized by uh, the Women in STEM Seminar Committee at the Grantham Institute uh, at Imperial. My name is Clara and I'm part of the Women in STEM Seminar Committee and I'm very excited to welcome you all to our first seminar of the year around the theme of conservation. Uh, so the seminar series is run by PhD students at Imperial and our goal is to celebrate underrepresented genders in STEM, highlight their research and provide a platform to discuss to discuss both the challenges and successes they may have faced in their career. Uh, this seminar will not only cover uh, our speakers' research and work in conservation, but also their experiences of being a woman in STEM and in conservation. So just before we start, we have an exciting, engaging, hour-long uh, discussion coming up, um, but just a few housekeeping notes. So um, the structure of our events, the first thing we're going to start with is a message from Jane, uh, Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, who is the founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and UN Messenger of Peace, um, who has recorded a video for us. Uh, and then uh, I will pass it to Bonnie, our chair, who will facilitate the panel discussion and introduce our speakers. Um, the panel discussion will then be followed by a Q&A and refreshments in the foyer. Um, and you will have a chance to ask questions at the end of the session. And for the people online, please mute your microphones, uh, unmute yourselves at the end if you want to ask questions, or you can start putting your questions in the chat and we will address them at the end. Uh, the same thing for the people in Silwood, and thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, I think that's it. Uh, and this session is going to be a recorded session, and the recording will be available at the end. Um, so before we start, our seminar will focus on conservation, which is the science of saving our planet. A conservation research can take many forms, ranging from the biology of threatened species to community-based activities uh, to develop sustainable economies. This research then acts to influence policy at all scales, ranging from local projects such as the Urban Wildlife Garden Project at the Natural History Museum to large global change, including the Global Ocean Treaty that I'm sure Heather will discuss later. Um, so our panelists today are all leading women in the field of conservation and span a wide range of disciplines ranging from enhancing carbon stocks in soils to managing an international partnership of non-governmental organizations. And we strongly believe that all forms of diversity are important in conservation and we hope to celebrate that today with you all. So uh, I'm going to quickly introduce Dr. Jane Goodall first for uh, her message and then I'll pass it on to our speakers. So Dr. Jane Goodall is founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and UN Messenger of Peace, and is a leading global advocate for people, other animals, and the natural world. Although her uh, initial work uh, focused on the study of chimpanzees, most recently, Jane has been a major proponent of conservation science globally, as she recognizes the toll that humanity has had on the species we share uh, our planet with. She founded Roots and Shoots, uh, an organization devoted to engaging young people and nature, with nature, conservation, and humanitarian issues over 30 years ago and continues her right to work today. She is currently in Tanzania, so she could not uh, join us, but she's recorded 20, a 20-minute 20 video to contribute to our seminar. seminar sorry. And for the online viewers, uh, we will facilitate the video if you can't see it. So, Dr. Jane, you all. Hello, this is Jane Goodall, and I'm really happy to share a few thoughts with you at this so important gathering. I was born loving animals, and by the time I was 10 years old, after spending hours out in nature and reading books, there was no TV back then, um, I decided when I was 10 years old, that I would go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. No thought of being a scientist. Women simply didn't do things. Hello. 
this is Jane Goodall, and I'm really happy to share a few thoughts with you at this so important gathering. I was born loving animals, and by the time I was 10 years old, after spending hours out in nature and reading books, there was no TV back then, um, I decided when I was 10 years old that I would go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. No thought of being a scientist. Women simply didn't do things like that in those days. In fact, there weren't any men going out studying animals in the wild. Everybody laughed at me, Jane, how will you do that? You don't have money, um, Africa's far away, it's dangerous, and you're just a girl. Dream about something you can achieve, but not my mother. She said, if you really want to do something like this, you'll have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity, and then if you don't give up, hopefully you find a way. Well, I worked very hard. I did extremely well at school, but couldn't afford university. Um, no scholarships back then, unless you were good in a foreign language, which I wasn't. Had to get a job. Went to London, did a secretarial course, very boring, and uh, got a job. Then came opportunity. A school friend invited me for a holiday to Kenya where her parents had just bought a farm. Uh, well, exciting, but had to get the money and couldn't save in London. So I'm speaking to you from the house where I grew up. I came here back home and I got a job as a waitress in a hotel around the corner, very hard work. And it took about, I don't know, five or six months before I'd saved up enough money for a return fare, which one had to get, uh, to Africa. In those days, by boat. There were a few planes, but they were very expensive. So what an amazing journey. Uh, we had to go all the way around Africa because there was a war between England and Egypt. So instead of going through the Suez Canal and round to Mombasa, we had to go all the way around the Cape and up. It took about a month. It was very exciting, seeing the sea get bluer, seeing the first flying fish and dolphins. First time I set foot on African soil was Cape Town. And it was very exciting. My mother had two friends there and they said they'd take me around while the ship was refueling, getting new supplies. But I kept seeing this writing in Afrikaans on the back of the seats and the doors to the hotels and the restaurants. Slechts Blanc. What did they mean? White people only. And suddenly I didn't want to be there. I wasn't brought up that way to judge people by the color of their skin. Well, uh, we left and when I got to Kenya, it was much better. Kenya was on the very brink of, uh, of, of independence from British colonial. Hello, this is Jane Goodall, and I got a job as a waitress in a hotel. So what an amazing journey. Uh, we had to go all the way around Africa because there was a war between... So what an amazing journey uh, for a return fare, which one had to get uh, to Africa. In those days, by boat, there were a few time I set foot on African soil was Cape Town their skin. Well, uh, we left. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> We're trying to fix it. Hello. Hello, this is Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall. Hello. 
Hello, this is Jane Goodall. everyone. Apologies for the technical issues. I think while we're waiting for Jane to rejoin us, I'm going to introduce uh, those of us who are here. Um, so my name is Bonnie Warren. I'm really honored to be chairing this panel. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here at the Grantham Institute on Climate Change. And as I introduce my co-panelists, I'm going to ask each of us to talk about the work that we do and how it relates to conservation. I'm an ecosystems ecologist. I study how land ecosystems take up carbon from the atmosphere. Early in my career, a lot of that focus was on how ecosystems respond to climate change. Now I study how we can better manage ecosystems to mitigate climate change through reforestation, for example. I'm going to hand over to Heather. Uh, evening, um, everyone, and thanks very much for having me here. Um, so I am uh, based at the Zoological Society of London. Um, I'm a bit of a random scientist, <laughs> um, focused on conservation solutions, but I'm a marine biologist by training, um, and I work on basically solving a range of problems in the marine environment, from marine protected areas, species recovery, plastic pollution, um, and how marine science and um, building marine science capacity can help uh, change the world. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Caroline Howe, and I'm a senior lecturer in environmental social science at the Centre for Environmental Policy, also at Imperial College. Um, and my background uh, was in zoology, but actually, as I've, I've sort of gone through my career, it's uh, sort of evolved into um, an understanding of social science and sort of the relationship that people um, have with nature and how fundamental um, that is to so a sustainable planet. So a lot of my work now is around um, sustainable uh, development um, and particular focusing on, on issues around equity and justice, particularly in natural resource use and access uh, to that. Thank you. Um, some themes we heard Jane touch on, although unfortunately we haven't heard her whole speech yet, um, was the importance of opportunity and support. She mentioned the support of her mother in helping her become one of the most world-leading scientists of all time. Um, both of you are leaders in your field. I'm interested in hearing what support you had, what guidance, mentorship, or advice that helped you navigate the career trajectory to get where you are today. Uh, it's a really, really good question. Um, and I think, I think mentorship that you've just touched on there is, is, really, is really fundamental. So, I've been, again, incredibly lucky. I, I also have an incredibly supportive uh, mother who was also a working mum, not in, not in science, not in conservation, but she sort of showed me what you could be. Um, and I always aspired to, to that kind of, um, sort of career. But I also had um, uh, my PhD supervisor, it was EJ uh, Milner Gulland, professor at Oxford University, and, and also um, during my um, uh, postdoctoral period as well. I was mentored by Dame Professor uh, Georgina Mace, and they were both incredibly um, successful, but also they, they were women that also had families and had sort of built up their careers and, and actually sort of, sort of uh, fought the sort of background that we had to, to, to become sort of leading people in our field. And they sort of both inspired me, but also provided that, that support. Um, they provided references, they kept putting me forward for jobs um, that, that were coming up. Um, pushed me to do more that I, that I, that I could do and they sort of believed in me and I think if you can find that, those mentors, they don't all have to be women either, I was, they, I'm just mentioning some of the women, but actually mentorship is really, really, really key um, in, this, in this field. Yeah, I, I can also relate to having a supportive mum. She, um, she applied to, well, she was at the Royal Vet College training to be a vet at a time where there was I think um, 10 women in 110 cohort, um, but then went off to marry my dad who was in the army, so <laughs> um, followed him around the world, but always made me believe that there was a possibility to, to do anything I really wanted to do and that gender wasn't a particular barrier. So I never really filtered it as a child. It's me and my sister, so there wasn't ever a 
gender competitive um, component in the family. And then career-wise, um, I think it has always been a mixture of taking opportunity, which Jane did touch on, and so saying yes rather than no, um, finding a peer support network as well, so people around you who will give you the, that support that you need, um, as well as the mentorship. So I've always had uh, bosses who are men, um, and I've had a right old mixture, <laughs> I can tell you. Um, but those ones that, um, I think some of the ones who gave me a, a break and believed in me, so I went from being a, post, a postdoc um, in the conservation genetics lab to curator of London Zoo Aquarium, which was a quantum leap in many, many ways. Um, but to get that job, which was, I was bet for a bottle of wine to apply uh, by a fellow postdoc who thought I could do it. And that was enough motivation to try and go for the job, which I got. And I think it was just, there was obviously, they saw something in me. Um, I wanted to not go down the full academia route. And having that belief and support that I could do, it was a very tough transition and a tough journey. Um, so I, I think it is always been supported by the people around you, your friends, your family, um, and your colleagues and the right ones, and then also those people who are there to who've got your back and who are there to support you. That's really great to hear. Um, I also wanted to point out it's fantastic to be sitting on a panel with such successful women. Um, but a recent report from the Royal Society for Biology showed that in the UK, at the full professor level, only 15% of faculty are women. Um, and the figure is actually lower than that in other disciplines. So there's still a long way to go. Um, and I was interested in your personal perspectives on why that might be. What barriers have you faced or the, those of your colleagues even? Yeah, I think, I think today, as International Women's Day is always a day to reflect on how far we've come and um, working at Zoological Society of London. So I've been there 28 years, which is probably old, longer than most people's age in this room. Um, but in that time, I started as a postdoctoral researcher, then was curator of the aquarium, and then moved to the conservation department. When I became curator, I was the third ever, and there's only been four, one more since. And the first was in 1918, then 1931, and then me. Um, so my, it came with a sort of uniform was a tie. That was in my requirements. Um, and all of the, scene, the directors were, were men. The, all of the council were men. All of the boards were men. Um, and actually, the first person who was a, a similar inspiration to me was Georgina Mace, who was our first director of science. So the first person to come in as a woman that you could actually see was in the decision-making um, field. I mean, I think there's many, um, many reasons. Um, we know that there's a lot of choices that you make during life, um, particularly when you're measured on your academic success. If you choose to have a family and take time out, then you have this gap in your CV. Um, there's lots of practical things about coming back to work after that and uh, finding and affording things like childcare and, and things so that that's, there's some practical um, elements of, of that choice and, and what that means in terms of your career development. We were talking about it before here and I'm sure you'll dig into that in more detail. Um, there's the recognition um, in roles and um, you know, that are not necessarily traditional, there's the expectation, so, and women are less likely to put themselves forward, so you've got the barriers of, well, she couldn't do that because she's a woman, and I don't think I can do it because I'm a woman, so it's those two sort of push, push me, pull use that are working against the system combined with those practical constraints. Yeah, I think you've touched on, on, on quite a lot um, uh, with that. The, uh, I mean, in, in our department, um, it's, it's very interesting. We, we have um, an MSc in, in environmental technology. And actually, um, very on the whole, most of the, the, the cohorts are about um, sort of um, two thirds women um, and a third uh, uh, men. Um, and then actually, when you get to the PhD level, it's still pretty high in terms of um, the sort of female to male ratios. Um, and then it dramatically starts to drop off um, as you reach the, the, the higher, the sort of, uh, yeah, sort of professorial levels. 
Um, and in, I'm, I think I'm quite lucky in the department that I'm in that they, they've recognised that and they are trying to work towards that. And how do you increase um, sort of uh, gender diversity um, at uh, the higher levels of sort of professorial levels? But actually, I think there are sort of barriers that they struggle to perhaps overcome because it's, it's more sort of um, ingrained. And I think some of the issues around, say, for example, having a family are, are a difficult one to, to balance. Um, if you do have a, a young family, you struggle you know, to do anything more than the sort of the 10 till 4. You, you have to deal with childcare issues. Um, it means that you, you, know, you can't just sort of be at evening seminars, evening events, things like that that often do occur. So I, there needs to be a sort of shift, I think, um, not just within environmental science um, and conservation, but obviously within, within academia, um, as a whole, that sort of acknowledge some of those those barriers. I think again, when you see other women having made it to the top, though, I think that does help. Again, it's that mentorship thing, that sort of aspiring um, element. Um, although things were, were very different, and so again, sort of referring to, to Georgina May, she once told me that when she went back to work after having had three children, um, she hadn't really started her career then. But she had to pretend she didn't have children. That was the only way that she could get ahead. Um, and now I hope we don't have to do that anymore. I hope it shouldn't be the case that we should pretend we don't have a family. We should embrace that, and hopefully we can still um, get get to those, those sort of yeah, to professorial levels. I do think it possibly might be something that maybe takes more time, um, and you have to just sort of accept that um, you don't whiz to the top. Um, but I hope that actually we are sort of beginning to break down some of those barriers because some of these departments are beginning to be aware um, that there is a problem and we need to we need to address it. What can we do to put things in place to support women um, in particular, but also actually support men? If men have paternity leave, then then there's no choice between a man and a woman if you're going to see who you're going to employ because they could both equally take nine months off um, and go on leave. So um, that, that's a sort of really key thing as well. Thank you. I think that raises um, an interesting point. So my next question was going to be, what advice would you have for a young woman who's just at the start of her career and how to navigate those work-life balance issues? But you bring up a good point. Also, what advice might you have for the partner of such a young woman um, who's facing that career trajectory? Um, I think you, you have to do what you love and you know, if you're passionate about it, there's always a way. And so I do have quite a lot of young women who are always asking me, you know, about making life plans and decisions. I'm the worst person to ask. My, my career has been just a following opportunity and, and um, it hasn't been very organised or structured. But um, I think, you know, if you, you will find ways of, of <laughs> doing things and... It does work out. And I remember coming back to maternity leave and from maternity leave, my whole life had changed. I'd been away for this whole period of time and I came back and some of the jobs, like the computer still wasn't fixed or you know, some of the things just hadn't changed. And people were like, oh, you're back already. And what, what is a big difference for you is not necessarily big in the, in the scheme of things of how things are running in your organisation. Um, I mean, I think it's also... We need to look to other cultures and advice. I mean, I was, I was explaining earlier that I've worked for many years um, co-founding Project Seahorse in the Philippines. So when I came back from maternity leave, I went straight to the Philippines because it's super family friendly. Uh, there was a great support network. Nobody thought you were weird if you turned up with a baby into a meeting. Um, it was embraced. It was encouraged. It was welcome. So I actually spent my first month back from maternity leave in the field because it was easier than coming back into a workplace that didn't want to acknowledge that you, you had children or didn't make it easy for you. And I gave another example of um, co-examining a master's um, thesis and it was um, a, a colleague from Stockholm. He was there as the professor uh, examining the thesis with his child and I, I was like, what, you know, there's a child on the screen, it was on Zoom, and, and, and basically that was completely acceptable and normal. So we have to shift what is okay and not. We have to recognize that all of us, whatever your family circumstance, have lives outside of work, and we need to work out how to support that and, and, and enable a life-work balance. 
Um, and it, you know, you know, and it is about a supportive. I mean, I have a hugely supportive husband, and I'm incredibly lucky that he's um, just been hugely supportive of my, of my career and allowing me to travel and being the primary um, caregiver. That's not an easy choice because he, he's been judged at the school gates when he's the one picking up the kids, and it's like she's away again, is she? And periodically, you know, we'll look at each other and he, he's like, I should support you. And I'm saying, I should be at home with the children. And then we say, nah, never mind, you know, it's, it's fine. So, it, you know, I think it is a case of finding out what's right for you in whatever relationship you're in. It's, it's not for everybody, but that's your deal. It's not for the outside world to judge you. It's really down to your family circumstance, your situation, your relationship, to decide what works for you. And there is judging in all sorts of ways. And some of for us was the strength to say, this is this works for our family and we're okay with that. And, and it's it's not your problem to worry about, it's ours. And you know, we, we now have children who are nearly grown up. So <laughs> we've made it a certain um, stretch of the way. Um, but as one final point is obviously we're looking very different contexts in very different places. So I now run an international program across the Indian Ocean. And the other thing is looking at what leadership means and in, in other countries when there's far more barriers than we currently face in the global north compared to the global south and where um, the opportunities are still that fierce battle that you have to create to say, yes, I can make it as a young woman of color working in a certain cultural context where it may be you can only reach a senior position if you're a, a man who's been in the job for 400 years. And so there's the peer support network we need to have is not just us looking after each other in places like Imperial, or play, which are thinking and holding seminars like this, but how do we expand that peer support network in a global sense to find um, mechanisms where we can elevate support and provide, um, you know, opportunities for um, everyone, really. Um, yeah, I agree uh, with everything with that. Uh, I've, again, I've been very lucky. I have um, a supportive um, partner who does stay at home a lot of the time um, and looks after the children um, when I'm um, away from work. I, I don't actually uh, live in London, so I commute for work. Um, but I think one of the things, unfortunately, you do have to, I suppose, accept a little bit is that you do have to make some kind of choices. Um, so around field work in particular. So if you are interested in being a conservationist now when you're, you know, you're young and you don't perhaps have any kind of family responsibilities, I really encourage you to travel, to explore, to do all of that, um, because it comes so much more challenging when you do eventually have a family. So I have done periods of field work, but I don't go for a long time, for a long period of time now. So a week or so I can manage, more so because I get emotional than, than actually so much that the children aren't okay. Um, but that is one barrier that then it just naturally occurs um, and it becomes harder. So you have to sort of balance your time away. But I think in other institutions as well are beginning to put things in place to support that. So for example, I work a lot um, with the British Ecological Society um, and they started doing things like having um, more support for people to come to conferences. So if you're um, a dual partner who would both like to go to the conference, you only pay for one of you. And you can also bring your baby and then that costs you less if you bring your child. They're quite happy. There's loads of babies. You see them now all over the conference walking around. And, 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 and it becomes more natural. And I think when that does happen, that changes the system. And I hope that other conferences and, and other organisations pick up on things like that and, and change them. And then certainly in terms of working um, in other countries, again, I think, oh, yeah, the, the, the barriers for us here are very different to the barriers in, in other countries. Um, but I've, I've worked with some incredible women. Um, I, I do quite a lot of work in Tanzania. And some of those women have, 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 have done amazing things. And they're still bringing up families and they're doing all this research. Um, and they're breaking down their own barriers. And I think, again, that there's, there's someone to, those people are also someone to aspire to. And I hope that it becomes more opportunities for, for those women as well to share their stories. Um, and I think, obviously, with technology now, it means that that's a lot easier for them to, to have some of these, you know, these, these, these workshops and things. Um, but again, providing that platform 
um, to allow those women to also share their stories too is, is really important. Thank you. Those are really great reflections. <clears throat> I wanted to say that um, for me also, it was really helpful. So I come from a long line of sort of academic uh, women, both my um, undergraduate supervisor, my PhD supervisor, and my postdoc supervisor were all women. And that really helped me because each of them had a different sort of solution to the work-life balance issue. Some chose to be child-free, um, some brought their families with them when they were in the field, others managed it a different way. And there is no one way to do it right. There's a lot of choices available, a lot of ways to sort of manage that tension between your personal life and your work life. And I think maybe the more women we get into the higher levels of science, the more opportunities we have to see the array of options that are available. It doesn't all have to be one way. I wanted to pick up on a theme that both of you mentioned, which I think is really important. So conservation biology by nature is sort of intersectional. We're not just in the lab. We're not just at the university. We're out dealing with policymakers, the public. We're at field sites. Um, so I'm interested in sort of two sides to it. Has that posed unique challenges to you as a woman in this field? And has that provided opportunities for connection or to help break down some of these other barriers that exist um, outside of academia? It's a big question. <laughs> um, I think it, it sort of works. I've had mixed experiences, I guess, and that's the that's the usual thing. I've I've been in meetings with decision makers who are looking for the man who's going to be making the decision or must be leading the project, and they're sort of waiting for them to arrive. And it's like, it's you can look all you like, but this is what you've got. So there's overcoming some of those where the, there's sort of the assumptions made about you just because. Um, and particularly when I was younger, um, you know, you'd go in and, and I think also how you deal with that. So I learned um, when I was, I was very young in my first job. And so I used to overcompensate by being incredibly boring and serious because I thought nobody would take me seriously unless I proved that, you know, get beyond the, the fact I'm a young woman and I really know what I'm talking about. And so it was incredibly intense and um, and so I actually learned to lighten up a little bit after a while, just because I knew it wasn't really working. Um, and then other times, you know, as, as you spent, I was really fortunate to be part of a National Geographic expedition, which was um, really a uh, vast majority were women from Bangladesh, um, from India, um, and, and wider internationally. And that was an extraordinary opportunity to... Um, work together and you've never you can't imagine arriving on a boat in Bangladesh getting off the boat we're all in our um, kurtis walking on the riverbank then a bunch of social scientists would head into the communities we had a drain pilot we had um, people doing water sampling and the optics from the community and local government partners of just 12 women getting off a boat and going and doing a whole spectrum of science helped us to have a lot of great conversations and broke down a lot of barriers, particularly when we went into the schools. And you could see the um, young girls um, getting so excited about the opportunity to meet women. And I think it is that that opportunity to, to be role, role models, but to show that there is somebody who looks just like you, who has a career that you could do too. And then for us to look at how we can create those pathways Yeah, I've definitely faced the same thing where you're sitting in a room full of policymakers and they want the man to turn up. Or they even look at you know, there's someone who's actually the research assistant and assume that they must be the, the lead of the, the project because they are male that are with you. Um, it can be incredibly frustrating when that happens. Um, I think in terms of some of the uh, challenge that can happen, especially when you're younger as a woman doing sort of field work, is that inevitably a lot of conservation takes place in countries that can, can be quite politically unstable and can be quite dangerous. Um, and I, from my own perspective and from a lot of my own, my colleagues, you know, often have been sometimes in quite potentially dangerous situations um, from a female perspective. Um, and that makes it challenging to go away and do this kind of, of research. Um, and it is a barrier. Um, and, you know, so often you, you then have to go as a group. So there's a large number of you and you're not alone, um, making sure that you have a well-established networks you know, of support in those countries that you're working in. But then in terms of the sort of benefits of, of, of being a woman doing this kind of research, so I, I said I'm a social scientist, so a large part of my work is 
sitting in focus groups and, and, and talking to people about their experiences. And I get to hear perspectives that you just can't have as a man. Because, you know, I will sit in, in focus groups full of women and they will tell you stuff they would never tell any male. And it's, it's fascinating, you know, and the work that I've been doing in Tanzania at the moment, um, it's sort of about dignified development, the female perspective on what constitutes, what they say constitutes dignified development, it's so different from their male counterparts. And we've only picked that up because actually myself and actually, like I said, one of, the, one of our um, key um, uh, members in our, in our research group in Tanzania, she has done a lot of that research and they have spoken to her about it because they can do, they feel they can relate to her and, 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 and share that knowledge. And that's a really great um, opportunity, I think, in one of our conversations. That's actually really inspiring. Um, and it relates to a question I had about why conservation science, which on the face of it is about protecting biodiversity, why as a discipline it needs the perspectives of men and women, people from the global north and the global south. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think conservation has traditionally sat in science. And in some ways, the public perception is that it's, it's the scientists have got this. It's OK, you know. But actually, if we actually think about what's really effective and where the opportunities are in science, we can see amazing things happening through communication. Um, law has a huge, you know, the, the high seas treaty that Clara mentioned earlier is, you know, that's um, relying on environmental lawyers. Um, as we look at, you know, there's campaigners, there's conservation is, so to, to get this done, we just um, really need to be thinking about all the disciplines that need to come together and for everyone to start, you know, sort of take responsibility and engage. and. Um, one of the colleagues in the Marine Science Programme, Dr. Asha DeVos, who's from Sri Lanka, if you are interested in this topic and you haven't uh, sort of looked at her stuff, look at her TED Talks and read her papers, amazing woman. But she said, you know, conservation is about building the biggest team in the world. And that's, you know, we are a very small team. All of the conservation organisations all together don't even rank compared to most big businesses. You know, we're... we're absolute minority here so we've got to build this biggest team in the world and that means uh, both addressing the current inequities in the system um, and that is the bulk of publications on the topic the bulk of expertise is sitting very and resourcing is sitting very firmly in the in the global north and yet you know in a marine context 70 percent of coastlines are in the um, global south so we we have to shift um, the you know balance of, of power we have to um, shift the inequities to actually get to a point where we can actually address conservation globally through the uh, capacity exchange for recognizing the broader science of local ecological knowledge traditional knowledge as a science in itself and actually if you look at the most the strongest and most robust conservation areas in the world most of those have been traditionally run by indigenous people for many, many, many um, decades. And that's where conservation is, but it's not defined as conservation, of course, in that context. So there's a lot to learn and there's a certain um, arrogance in our world of science. So I, I think sometimes the women's perspective can be very useful on the ground. It can be useful in terms of empathy and just being diverse. I mean, it's we're half of the planet so you know if, if you're looking at a system where it's majority to one gender that's going to just emphasize certain parts and then there's the, all the other diversity that needs to be including beyond gender if we really are going to solve these very time critical problems we don't have a, we, you know we're looking at eight years now so when you start thinking of your career ahead we have to tra absolutely transform what we currently do in eight years so that's finish your master's or finish your phd do one postdoc and in that time we've got to have completely transformed things so if we don't start embracing diversity and make things more equal even as fundamental sitting in london as you know white women with the privileges we have and talking about how unequal it still is in many ways we have a long way to go so it's all of our responsibility to actually do that 
I think conservation has changed quite dramatically even in the time that I've uh, been doing um, this, this, this work. And it originally was very much a science-based, you know, based in ecology kind of um, field of research. And now it really has emerged as this completely interdisciplinary, possibly transdisciplinary subject that draws on all of these other different areas of expertise. So actually, in a way, anybody can be a conservationist. You know, if you, if you love the planet and you want to sort of solve inequalities and work towards sustainable development, you are a conservationist. Um, and I think that that is really exciting. And I think that opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, to, to hopefully solve a lot of these problems that we couldn't have done from a, just a, a siloed perspective before. But in, again, particularly in terms of the, the, the gender question, there is so much research that's done out there that also shows just how much role women play in actually just managing and protecting our natural resources. Um, and and very, like I said, very traditionally, when people have done all the kind of so, the social science, and they've only focused on what they go into the communities, they, they ask a lot of like a series of focus groups. Obviously, the people that come forward tend to be the research, you know, the sort of um, community leaders. They often all are male, and you miss that perspective of actually how a lot of those natural resources are managed and what they're actually needed for. And it's very different what they're needed for if you're a woman or a young girl or if you're a man. Um, and you need all of those, all of those reasons, those needs need to be incorporated. Um, but also, there has been again a lot of research showing that when you give women power to act, have a leadership role, to manage their own resources. They do it amazingly. And, and, and it, we sound surprised, but of course it isn't surprising, but it's, it's, it's rarely done. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things that's come about that um, sort of, I suppose that will help with what Heather is saying, that we need to have this transformative change in the next eight years or so, is that, so out of COP15, there was obviously the sort of um, global biodiversity framework and a set of series of targets but one of those, uh, Target 23, actually specifically says that gender and inequalities around gender have to be incorporated into the, co the conservation of biological diversity. That's where it comes from. And that's the first time ever that that's been done. So it's, there is also a target that's specifically around indigenous local knowledge and in, in involving local communities and, and things like that. But there is this particular one that's around gender, which I think is fascinating. And I think if we can achieve that in eight years, then that will be a really amazing thing. We can make it longer time if you like. <laughs> 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 Please. Um, I think th those are really fantastic pieces of evidence to bolster the idea that we need full participation of everyone in conservation science. And I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So I'm going to ask you one final question before we open up the floor, which is, Given the changes that you've seen in the course of your career, what, how far do you think we've come and what do we need to do next to raise women to the level of equal participation in the conservation sciences? I think we've come some distance. I'd have liked to say we've come further, but I don't think we have come as far as I probably would have liked. Um, and again, there's one thing I once remember discussing with my mum and I was complaining about the, the challenges of being a woman in, in, in a, a working woman in science and academia. And she was sort of said that you know, 30 years ago she was still having those same challenges. And so some things have changed, but not yet enough. Um, but I think that these kind of events, but but all of these events, so International Women's Day, it's huge now. It's all over the front, it's the it's live running pages on the newspapers. It's a really big thing, and I think that does raise awareness of, of all of these issues, that actually um, there's 50, like I said, 50% of the world is out there ready to participate and join in with all of these elements, and we have to, but we have to support each other. We do have to do that. You know, you lift each other up, drag up everybody with you, you know, get your PhD students and make them do things and send them off into the world, um, you know, challenge them on, on that kind of thing. So in the same way that people did it for us, do that for, for your peers and do it for people that come um, after you as well. Um, don't don't drag, up, drag up the ladder. Keep the ladder down and keep dragging people up with you. Um, I, I think one aspect of this is it's really nice to see a lot of men in the room <laughs> um, because it's easy to have a conversation 
you know, mm. of women, and we're all nodding and going yes, and then you know, it, but actually, it, it, it is um, for for everybody to participate in this conversation and to think in your situation, you know, what can you do to elevate and provide opportunities for women, and and right from the beginning in early stages of your career, you can read about it, you can listen, you can hear about the challenges, and just listening to your friends, to your peers and looking at who those mentors are for you in the space that you want to be in and where you want to go. Um, there's lots published on the topic as well. We've, we've sort of touched on various things. So you, you can read and familiarise yourself with some of these issues, and then you can look to see how you can be an ally to somebody in the space. So um, one example I, I, I'll give is that, um, and I think this came from EJ, but... Basically, if you're in a lecture theatre and somebody puts their hand, you ask for any questions, you put your hand up at the end. If a man asks the first question, most women won't engage in the questioning. If a woman asks the first question, asks, asks the first question and responds to it, then more women will step forward. So a very simple thing for lecturers or for anybody running an event is to try and encourage a woman to ask the first question. So there's very simple things like that that we can think about just to start shifting the dynamic, um, providing opportunities. If you're in a, in, a, in a group and somebody asks you to feed back, who's automatically stepping forward to feed back? You know, how do you give it to the voices? And that's not necessarily just women, but how do you be just more inclusive in terms of the way that you think? Provide more opportunities for people and recognise that everybody's got a contribution. We're in a very elite situation here, right? You've got more education than most people on the planet, by far. We're in a position of knowledge, of knowing the situation. We know about inequalities, we know about conservation, we know about science, and you have the training to do that. So that, but we all have imposter syndrome, right? 28 years on, still sitting here going, why am I here? You know, it is a case of saying, uh, okay, what can I do? What are the steps I can take? And it's not a case of when I finish my course, I will do that. It's how you act today, tomorrow, next week, next year. It's, it makes a huge difference. And small shifts in dynamics make a massive difference. Just thinking about the committees you run and all of your day-to-day -day interactions. How are you doing those? How are you making them more inclusive? And how are you elevating people who are not comfortable? That, that you, how do you empower people to feel that they have a voice too and they can express it? Thank you so much. And I wanted to add, it looks like most of our audience today is people fairly early in their careers. And I'm continually inspired by the upcoming generation of scientists. I think in general, um, your commitment to issues of equality and diversity and inclusion far outstrips what we saw in my own generation. And that's a really good sign that progress is coming. All right. Um, I'm going to quickly take over. Thank you so much for this very insightful discussion. We had um, a fourth speaker who unfortunately could not make it today, Patricia Azurita. She's the CEO of Birdlight International. She was born and raised in Ecuador, and she's the first um, wo a woman from a developing country to run a, a conservation organization. Uh, so because she couldn't make it today, she's recorded a very short video to, that will hopefully run this time. Uh, and she is online, so she will be there for the Q&A. So after the video, we'll move to the Q&A. And for Jane Goodall's uh, recording, we'll put it at the end for people who want to stay around. Otherwise, it will be on YouTube for you to watch in your own time. And apologies uh, for that. Um, so hopefully, we get it running. Um, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patricia Zurita. I'm the chief executive of BirdLife International. We are a family of over 115 organizations around the world protecting birds, but as a conduit to protecting nature. I'm incredibly, incredibly sorry not to be there with you today. Um, happy World uh, International Women's Day uh, to all of the women. 
uh, that are in the room. Um, uh, I was really planning on being with you, but unfortunately, uh, one of my twin girls had a bad fall on Monday and ended up breaking her foot. Uh, so I just, um, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't make it work. Um, this is her uh, at the ER um, on um, half past midnight yesterday. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 all the childcare arrangements that I made for her to be taken care of uh, on normal circumstances didn't apply for this new reality. So apologies for not being there with you. Um, but I am very happy that both Jen and Theo were able to um, accommodate a video from me um, to share with you a little bit more my experiences as a woman uh, leading the a conservation organization. I am the first woman uh, from a developing country leading an, a major international conservation organization. I'm very proud of it. But with that also comes a lot of responsibility as well. Um, I, I wanted to approach the video or give you my message in terms of three key points. Um, I think the first thing is about conservation and why it is so important to make sure that we have a a diverse workforce, uh, a diverse group of people looking after the planet. Um, women bring in extraordinary sensitivity and, and a, a value to and an approach to science and conservation that, you know, it complements very well and actually adds up a lot to the vision and the approach that men have had over the years. Um, I am incredibly happy to work with Women leaders, uh, we uh, I think we we understand nature because after all, it's mother nature, uh, and I think that that sense of um, uh, being a mother and the capacity of being a mother, even if you don't have children, um, is something that is so innate to us women that actually really relates very well to the role of conservation and to the world of taking care of things. Uh, conservation is all about protecting, is about restoring, is about making it work and putting things back in balance. And, and I think being a woman, uh, you have a, a huge sense, as I said before, innate in you uh, to, to manage those things. So um, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, achieving uh, the role that I have achieved with BirdLife, uh, but I'm more, more than, uh, more than proud and, and in awe and incredible um, uh, inspiration that the women in the conservation community and particularly in the Burley family um, provide to me. I mean, every single time that I see a woman CEO uh, or a woman technician or a woman leading a forest program or a wetland program, um, I am in absolute awe because I know how hard it is um, and I know how, um, important it is that we continue to open up the space for these extraordinary women leaders to come and continue to uh, help us uh, protect this amazing planet that we're losing so fast. Um, it is challenging and that's my second message. Uh, it's not easy um, and, and there are multiple, uh, multiple challenges including as you saw me not being able to be there with you because if you don't have the right support system all the time uh, or if your support system fails, then you cannot do your job properly. Uh, I mean, um, it, and and that my one of my advice to the young women in the room uh, is remember that it is possible, but that you have to look into building up that support system that helps you um, achieve your your dreams and 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 your professional uh, career. Um, it does require uh, additional help. But I think it is also something that we're incredibly capable of doing. I was telling Theo uh, over email this morning when I um, when we were trying to coordinate this video that normally I have a couple of backups. And unfortunately, this time my backups uh, didn't work either for, because of COVID or because of family illnesses. So I'm, I'm really uh, sorry that I, all of this got combined and I couldn't make it to you. Um, Support systems are important and you can build them. And sometimes we're incredibly shy to ask for help. 
uh, and not only in terms of you know having someone to look after your children uh, or after your pets uh, when you need to commit to something professionally, but it's it's in, it's incredibly important to remember that you have a support system that is willing to help you in grow, in terms of growing professionally. Um, and, and we tend to be incredibly shy. We tend to kind of stay back because the minute that you ask for support, you feel that you are weaker um, and not as, um, you know, not as strong, not as uh, as competitive or, uh, you know, it kind of lowers your standard a little bit. I would say, brush that off your head. It's incredibly important to ask for help and people are more often than not willing to tend your hand and help you grow um, as a leader. Uh, so, it is challenging, but there's people out there who want to help you. Um, and it, you know, the conservation world has grown in diversity and it's lovely to see so many new uh, in, um, CEOs of international conservation organizations and as well as local organizations um, and leaders in the uh, scientific community as well. Uh, I think it is changing. I think it's changing uh, for good. Um, and but I think it we we as women have also the responsibility of making that space and enabling more women to come to be part of this process. Um, and it's not always easy. Um, but I think so long we have that conscious um, commitment to make the space uh, for a more diverse uh, workforce, not only women, um, you know, um, a gender balance, but you know, having a whole diversity of. Uh, and representation in, in your workforce makes the work so much better. There's so much more creativity. There's so many more um, solutions that are coming from completely different angles that you haven't thought about when you have uh, diversity. So um, I, I think there's, there's a bright future ahead. That doesn't mean that we have to be complacent. That doesn't mean that we have to sit down and forget about uh, working and, and making the effort of uh, securing more space for women uh, and, and for a more diverse and equitable and, um, you know, a right type of workforce. I think we have to make um, the conscious decision of looking for spaces for more diversity um, and enabling more diversity to happen in our organizations. But I think there is a, a, a bright future ahead. I think we women have demonstrated that we can be extraordinary <laughs> leaders. Um, and, and I think there's a lot more respect now for all of the extraordinary um, input that we bring to the table. So with that, um, again, I am incredibly sorry not to be with all of you. Um, I am going to turn to my, uh, my, my uh, child with her broken foot and hear her really hard time moving around on crutches. Um, well, I hope that you guys have a wonderful session um, and I'm going to thank again Theo and Jen for enabling me to be with you uh, over video. Uh, have a wonderful session. Happy uh, International Women's Day. Um, it is about balance. It's about uh, having the right uh, diversity and having the right balance for the planet, for science, for our future. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patricia, for, for recording that video for us. And we can all see you in the audience there. So thanks a lot for your message. Um, I will now open the floor for a discussion. So if any of you have any questions, please raise your hand. I will give the microphone back to our speakers. And for the people online, you can write your questions on the chat. We will address them. And for the people at Silwood, you can either write them in the chat or I think you have a moderator there, so maybe you can raise your hand on Zoom and we can address it. Um, but yeah, um, questions? Yes. Um, so I had a question for the panel in general and then one question for Patricia specifically as well. A little bit about me, uh, I'm from India and I'm an MSc student at the Center for Environmental Policy studying conservation policy specifically, and my question was, as you see more of a social science influence in conservation and more of a focus on indigenous inclusion in um, indigenous sources of knowledge, do you find that that's also leading to more of a push for inclusion as we see social dynamics gain more importance in conservation, which was previously considered to be more of a hard science? 
Patricia, thanks so much for joining us. Do you want to take that question first? Sure. Um, and, and thanks so much for accommodating me in these crazy circumstances. I think it was a perfect example of how much women actually have to juggle when you have to work and, and take care of your family. Um, look, I am I'm, I'm an environmental economist and I completely agree that we need more social science uh, and inclusion of indigenous and local communities vision in the conservation community. I think we have made bounce and leaps in terms of in, in inclusive um, uh, participation of local communities in some areas, more in, geographically more areas than others. I think Latin America is possibly one of the leading areas uh, in terms of the role that indigenous people in particular have played in terms of conservation. It has to happen a lot more, um, but I'm really happy to see a lot more of a recognition of the role of social sciences, not only you know, um, heart biology and, and ecology and, and thinking about evolution and, and, and the, the nature of nature, but also how important it is the interaction with people and how important it is that nature is actually the basis of all of what we do and all of what we depend on. Um, I, I, I did a degree on um, um, environmental economics precisely because after doing uh, um, my college uh, degree in, in environmental sciences, I felt that unless we actually uh, could argue uh, forcefully for the value of nature in our economy, we were not going to be able to save it. Um, I, I still stand by that. I don't think it's the only thing. I don't think the, on, the only argument to save nature is the economic value. I think there's so many more um, reasons why and, and just the intrinsic value of nature and, and the right for nature to, be, to, to exist is important. Uh, but I think in, in, a, in a world where uh, the economic elements uh, prevail. I think having that social uh, analysis of, of, of the economy and, and the role that, that nature plays in the economy is incredibly valuable. Um, as well as, you know, many other of the social sciences, anthropology, sociology, a, a lot of our relationship with the planet, the culture, the history. Um, it's it's incredible. All the political sciences are incredibly important in terms of making our, our argument. And I love uh, what... Um, I, I, I couldn't see on my phone, sorry, my computer is not working properly, uh, but I couldn't see on the phone who was saying about, uh, talking about this, but uh, having that notion of the conservation team being as big as possible and as diverse as possible is absolutely right. And I think it's not only about traditional diversity of gender and you know um, nationality or, or where you come from, but actually precisely this type of different um, a multidisciplinary um, a approach that we need to have because the reality is that nature is in everything. Um, so yeah, um, hope that that's coming clear. I'm, 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 I am, I have a lot of noise around me with my children here. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, like I said, I before that the the inclusion of social science now within conservation is so exciting um, and I think it brings in so much more depth to it as a subject matter um, but also like I said I think it actually will help us to solve a lot of the conservation problems that we have that we couldn't have necessarily done um, before um, without including a lot of those topics but you also asked about wider diversity and, and the sort of broadening of things and I think so we the, the MSC um, so there are two MSCs within the Centre for Environmental Policy, the one you're on the Conservation Science, which is new this year, which is really great. Um, and we have the Environmental Technology one that's been running for a very long time. Um, and I actually did it about 15 years ago, and it, and it has changed as well. The, 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 the degrees that we're teaching and the, the topics that we're bringing into that have changed. And that, I think that's really important because that's what the demand is for. That's what the students want. They want to see those, those subjects being taught because they know they're going to be relevant to solving these crises, these environmental crises. They're going to need all of these that, all that information. But also the diversity of students that we have on those courses has changed over time as well. We have so many more people from all around the world. Um, and that is great because they offer these perspectives that we cannot offer. Like I said, we're, we're very sort of non-diverse panel of these three of us sitting here and, and those other perspectives are great they add a lot of, of interest um, to that um, and, and, and I said and perspectives and I think that's really really important and I hope that we continue to grow um, with that and actually Imperial in particular has offered beginning to offer a number of studentships um, particularly related to women um, actually we've got one on Southeast Asia women from Southeast Asia for example 
um, and they're expanding a lot of these options to try and bring in more diversity um, and, and allowing women, women and well, hopefully other diversities as well, but women in particular to come and to study here, which I think is really important. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the programme that I run at the moment for the Bertrelli Foundation, which is focused on marine science in the Indian Ocean region, all of the projects within that have to be um, interdisciplinary and work with regional partners. So that's the sort of rules. One of the challenges is that um, science, different scientific different disciplines speak totally different languages, right? So we've got physicists working with biologists, uh, you have geneticists working with um, oceanographers, you have social scientists working with um, fisheries experts, and we need to get better at breaking down some of those barriers between disciplines. And there can be a snobbiness around certain topics, and our training in science is to critique, right? You want to find the weakness, you want to bash it down. So social science can be seen as a, as a soft science, and, oh, well, it's not really, you know... How do you do R with that? You know, it's sort of, so I think there's, you know, it, it can be, sometimes there's a lack of um, understanding. When you're in the policy space or looking at things like the UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development, the most common question is where are the social scientists? We need the social scientists. We, they, we need more social science in the room. So I, I think there is that, is changing rapidly, interdisciplinary science is changing. It's tricky and we have to, it, but it comes to a mindset, right? Being open to listen to different perspectives. And that's why these conversations about local ecological knowledge, respecting that as a type of science and, um, you know, the, 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 the huge value of all of that, the, the knowledge and data, it's just not presented in a scientific paper form. So it's, our job as scientists to be open to all forms of science and to use that to accelerate change. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I, I had two questions. The first one is, oh, sorry, first of all, thank you for the, the talk. It's really nice to have all the insights in, into life as a, a woman in conservation science. My partner is a PhD student in conservation, so it's really nice to, to hear from you. Um, First is, what could universities do to help avoid that career or family choice? So would on-campus childcare be a good idea or like normalizing the presence of children in the workplace? Do these things maybe helpful? And the second one is, you mentioned that uh, if someone has a child, it's a gap in the CV uh, and it's to take a break, but raising a child is, not, it's not easy, right? It's a, challenging task so should, shouldn't that be so there's a skill shouldn't it count as experience and you know as, as we've just seen um it's work and also with mentoring being so prevalent in academia sh shouldn't it be sold as a skill and as experience rather than seen as something that's taking a break <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll answer one thing. Um, so I think a lot of what needs to change in terms of helping people balance their family obligations and their work, and not even just children in that, people have other caring responsibilities or other parts of their personal life that are important, is um, needs to be led sort of from the top. Um, so one thing that we didn't focus on in this panel is actually the tremendous advantage that you as an academic have in balancing work and family because you do have some degree of flexibility. And I think at later career stages, once you're a member of faculty, for example, you have sort of more flexibility than someone with a traditional nine to five job does. Um, and so if you are supervising people with family responsibilities, then you have to set a culture that you understand and respect that um, and to try and facilitate, um, you know, understanding that people's working hours or their working patterns might not obey the nine to five standard. I was also given some really good advice at one point, which was that you should put your maternity leave or parental leave on your CV, um, because actually it isn't a gap. Um, it, it is a, a specific uh, break, but actually you're actually learning, yes, a whole new set of skills. Um, 
how to manage you know, a whole another, another job, another household, um, and also do your work at the same time. Um, and actually, the same advice from the, the same source is also that if you're going to put in an application, um, that what you do is you, know, you might just say, well, okay, I've got five papers published, for example, and, and it's taken me five years. But actually, if it hasn't taken you five years because you spent two of those on maternity leave and you've also been balancing these childcare responsibilities for the other three of those years, that actually both five publications are amazing because you've done it in even less time than, than somebody who's done it over five years. And you should shout that out from the rooftops. You should, you should, and actually, someone even said calculate it. Calculate precisely how effective you've been in that period of time, taking into their account. And when I did that on the first job application I did, I got the job. So I, I don't know, okay, so it's, it's one anecdote, it might not have that was definitely the case, maybe it was the right job for me, but it certainly worked, so I would definitely recommend that as a, as a sort of guidance for anyone applying for jobs in the future. Um, so I have an honorary professorship at the University of Exeter, and I think like here and many other places in the Institute of Zoology, which is the academic arm of um, ZSL, um, is the Athena Swan scheme and seeing the progress around that in just um, all sorts of areas has been huge and provided a much more um, friendly and easier environment, whether it's just when you time things, that if it's an evening event that children must be welcome, that's at Exeter, if you, if, I don't know if it is here, but just from my experience, and obviously there's more funding available, so for, to um, allow women to come back into the workplace to give a year funding, recognising that that's going to be a, a, a pipeline to write grants and things. I think the funding and the example you gave of the British Ecological Society, there are more and more organisations doing things at conferences that are much more family friendly. Um, also, National Geographic, um, if any of you are interested in, have a look at that for being an explorer which gives funding for early career but once you're in that network they now have funding to allow for family support for field work so they either allowing you to bring your family or to provide childcare funding additional childcare funding while you're away so while it's just a handful so at least there was none at all before so i think we're starting to see that kind of um thinking which is obviously providing a way of reducing many of the barriers that women have um, I, I took my kids on field work for until they cost a full plane ticket and then I just couldn't, you know, we couldn't afford to, um, all the costs of going and watching mummy work meant that we couldn't do any kind of family activity or holiday or anything else. So we, then I started traveling on my own. So that, that's, so seeing this funding come in, that could have unblocked some of that, that the kids could have traveled me, with me for a bit longer would have been amazing. Patricia, do you have any insights from the NGO sector? Yeah, and um, I wanted to echo what it was said before about the flexibility, the importance of, of looking for um, or building up a, a workspace that is flexible and that is uh, acknowledging that, um, you know, sometimes you do have to run and pick up your children from school or you have to go and drop them off or you have to stay home because they're sick. Um, I think it is one of those... Uh, um, things that is changing. And I think the COVID pandemic has actually made us realize that, that there are other ways of working than just going to the office nine to five. I think conservation is a nine, you know, it's, it's, it's a 24 seven type of work that depending on what you do, uh, you will have to accommodate travel and, you know, field work. And, um, and, and I think as, as we are actually, actually flexible to give our time to protect the planet and work you know, sometimes endless hours and making sure that that what we are doing actually works. We are also pushing for employers um, and, and in the NGO sector to make sure that they also realize that, you know, we need to create these these um, these flexible environments and, and accommodating environments that are going to help us support not only uh, women working uh, with us, but also, you know, whole diversity um, of, of, our, of our workforce. Um, I think it's changing. I think it, it's um, if you compare the U.S. and the European system, uh, you know the U.S. is is incredibly less um, flexible. Um, I, when I when I work there before coming to BirdLife eight years ago, I, it was a lot harder. Uh, and if you didn't have a very, you know, organized childcare system, it was impossible to make it work. 
Um, and I was, that's why I was saying in the video, um, building up those support systems is incredibly important. Um, and, you know, looking for um, providing for those support systems as an employer is also very important. One of the challenges I would say, and I, you know, just just as a as a matter of a comparison, for example, I mean, and, and acknowledging the, the differences in sizes in terms of number of employees. When I used to work in Washington D.C., many of my friends used to work at the World Bank, and then they would have the access of having their child, the children being taken care of the nurseries that the World Bank had in their own building. Um, and whereas, you know, I was working with Conservation International and because we were substantially much smaller, we, we didn't have that access. And I think figuring out ways of, of um, joining forces with others uh, to provide, um, you know, um, uh, facilities for, for childcare is incredibly important, but also thinking about more of that flexibility that that accom accommodating those different type of work um, uh, patterns that that parents and, and young par parents have um, is, is is very it's, it's something that you have to advocate for and, and being in the leadership of Verla for example I have been a huge promoter of making sure that um, my um, uh, colleagues who who are uh, you know young mothers and are taking maternity leave that they they actually find ways of balancing things out and and when they call, want to come back, uh, we can work it out in a way that they they can really take care of the children at the same time that that they are enjoying and and, and fulfilling their professional um, uh, commitments and and their their professional dreams. I think the more that you can actually and I think that the if if you look um, into some of the research that the Harvard Business Review has done uh, as part of the of, of, of um, Harvard Business School, um, a lot more of the working corporate environment that enables uh, women to have more flexibility to be able to enjoy and be part of the uh, incredible journey that motherhood is at the same time that they are being able to develop and, and grow in their professional careers, the more loyal and the more committed and the more um, uh, productive uh, workers you end up having. So I think it is, is, is looking into forgetting that everything is five to, uh, you know, nine to five, um, remembering that, that life is complicated and chaotic and that sometimes you have to be more flexible and that the more that you as an employer can provide flexibility um, within limits and within reason, um, I, I think the more that you can actually have a workforce that is absolutely committed to the cause and, and committed to the organization. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists and the organizers for this great event. I'll pass over to Clara who has some final remarks. Thank you everyone for joining and special thanks to Bonnie, Jane, Patricia, Heather and Caroline for such an insightful discussion. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Christian, the Grand Family Institute for helping us out, Women at the Imperial Week, um, and our co and pilot for this session. Um, please check out also the rest of the events taking place for Women at the Imperial Week um, this week. Um, the recording and the discussion will be available online. And apologies for the questions that could not be answered and for Jane Google's video, but you will have the recording hopefully so you can look at it in your own time. Um, and yeah, just one last round of applause for our wonderful speakers. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. And so just drinks will be drinks and food. Ah, and sorry. So drinks and food in the foyer and please fill in it's not on the uh, our survey, which is upcoming on this. <laughs> Yeah, it would really help us for future events. And if you have any uh, speakers that you think might be interested in participating in these type of events for future ones, please reach out. We would be super keen to hear about uh, them or you. Yeah. Oh,
Okay. Oh, no, I don't think that's it. We'll be fine on the way. And then all the children are delayed as well. He was just walking around being like, I'm gonna go if anyone, I'm going in for if anyone please. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it took half an hour, and then we hopped on there, oh, and then that took half an hour. Uh, so for the dreams, you can go down two floors, and then the main entrance is right there. Yeah. I'm saying <laughs> I'll just check if I can get something. Maybe I'll leave. Yeah. Anyway, that's always the case. Right? Really? No, it's not going to be.